All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for the biggest malpractice, how hospitals betray the public trust with billions in fossil fuel pension investments report release. My name is Amy, she, her, and I'm the senior climate finance strategist at Stand.Earth, and I am joining you today from occupied New Cheyenne and Arapaho territory. We'd like to thank you for joining us with us today um, for this highly anticipated release of this report. We're so excited. Um, we will be releasing the report this morning um, and hearing from some really amazing speakers. Climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity and health professionals worldwide are already responding to the health harms caused by this unfolding crisis. While no one is safe from these risks, the people whose health is being harmed first and worst by the climate crisis are the people who contribute least to its causes and who are least able to protect themselves and their families against it. People in low income and disadvantaged countries and communities. We are here to connect the dots between the health effects of the climate crisis and the investments made by the institutions who end up caring for the people who are directly affected by the climate impacts. To decarbonize the healthcare sector, we must urge our institutions to stop investing money in the companies responsible for the crisis in the first place. Next slide. So just a little bit of quick Zoom logistics while we get started, this call will be recorded and all resources and recording will be sent out after. Uh, closed captioning is available. Please use the toolbar at the bottom of the screen to access that. Um, click the three dots and then grab that closed captioning. To ask questions, please use the Q&A function. Um, and uh, if you are pressed, please identify yourself and we'll try to get to those questions and direct them to the right speaker. Next slide. First this morning, um, I am very excited to introduce my very good friend, Don Lieber. Don is the campaign director for First Do No Harm. He is a surgical technologist and nursing unit coordinator at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, a climate activist, freelance writer, and a bass player. Previously, he was a lead uh, country researcher and author in uh, for the international campaign to ban landmines, and he is also a bassist for the Jersey Tenors. Um, I'm welcoming Don this morning to talk to us about the First Do No Harm campaign, how we got here, why he started this campaign, and why this report um, is so incredibly important. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Don. Hi, uh, thanks, Amy. Thanks to everybody who's here. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I work at Sloan Catering Cancer Center. And um, our campaign for fossil fuel divestment in the health sector uh, emerged among some of my colleagues at the hospital, a diverse group of healthcare professionals, our, out of our uh, increasing concern um, for the implications to global public health and health disparities uh, from fossil fuels and the accelerating climate crisis. That concern just was increasing with the with the, with the vo volumes of data we had been seeing across the medical literature. Um, our campaign also emerged uh, to support the increasing calls from within the sector itself to decarbonize, including at the highest levels. And I will cite um, the president of the National Academy of Medicine uh, co-authoring a highly acclaimed piece published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the title of which is A Call to Action, Decarbonizing the U.S. Health Sector. Our campaign and this report is in support of that call to action. So with that, let's uh, get to the report. You could, you could move to the next slide, please. Um, fossil fuel investments made by the health sector. Um, at surface struck us as a stark contradiction to our medical ethos of first do no harm uh, in contradiction, as I said before, to the calls for decarbonization and in contradiction to the emerging and very successful sustainability programs uh, across our sector. And at, at this point, let me quickly um, praise these sustainability programs in partnership with our hospitals, with industry, with health sector leadership at the National Academy of Medicine, and very much from groups like uh, Healthcare Without Harm. Um, a lot of people don't know that across our sector, hospitals are making great strides in reducing their emissions, 
uh, through operational reductions, waste reduction, greening the OR. We support that. We applaud these efforts. Our campaign, however, is pointing out up to now it has been a gaping void in these decarbonization efforts. Um, so uh, let's cut, cut to the numbers, put some, some substance to this. So you, you could turn the slide. The key findings of our report um, are that four case study hospitals, which we looked at, Kaiser, Mayo, HCA, and Ascension, and the last two may not be uh, extremely uh, high on, on, the, on the name recognition list, but they're very significant in the health sector, HCA, and Ascension are the two largest private health systems in the United States. So we looked at those two and Mayo and Kaiser and those four alone have 4.6 billion total fossil fuel investments across different investment categories. Most importantly, these four hospital systems have about $775 million in direct fossil fuel production. Um, and we ask everyone to consider that this is four hospitals out of approximately 1,200 private systems in the United States. Uh, our uh, researchers said that it's very likely that um, our hospital sector as a total then probably has many hundreds of billions of dollars invested in fossil fuels, likely upwards about 100 billion or so in direct fossil fuel production. That's very significant and cannot be ignored in any decarbonization effort. Um, you can move the slide now. Um, just briefly, these aren't just numbers, they have real world impacts for climate and for global health. These hospitals have direct investments in Suncor, ConocoPhillips, Total Energies, the biggest oil producers in the world that are, as we speak, managing the biggest fossil fuel projects in the world. Suncor, for example, is the world's largest holder of tar sands, bitumen uh, oil, which is 30 times more greenhouse gas impactful than traditional oil. Our hospitals have investments in that. ConocoPhillips has been in the news because that's the major uh, operator of the Willow uh, Pipeline project, a massive multi-decades pipeline project that's unfortunately uh, been, per uh, been permitted to start in Alaska. Another project that our hospitals are investing in uh, through Total Energies is the East Africa Crude Oil Pipeline Project. It doesn't get a lot of press, but it's a massive pipeline project in East Africa, in addition to being a massive carbon bomb, is displacing uh, local people. Um, these investments not only are direct harms to public health, um, uh, exacerbate the climate crisis, but profoundly exasperate, exacerbate public health disparities around the world. So you can move the slide now. Um, the problem seems pretty obvious. What are the solution? The, the, the solution is pretty obvious too. Divest this money, take it out. It might sound complicated, but I'll start with this. There are mechanisms in place for the health sector to do this. I cite the National Academy of Medicine's um, robust decarbonization program called the Action Collaborative for Decarbonizing the Health Sector. It consists of several working groups with different policy focuses, which constitute working partnerships with healthcare professionals, industry professionals, groups like Healthcare Without Harm. As I said before, they're making great progress uh, in operational reductions. Uh, we're calling on the National Academy of Medicine to include fossil fuel div divestment into this already robust, well-established program. Um, but this is the health sector. We do complicated things. Um, we, do, we, we do microsurgery. We map the human genome. Um, it's time we divest from fossil fuels. Um, I'll turn it back to Amy. Thanks again for your support, everybody. Yes, thank you so much, Don. 
Um, and we would like to thank everyone who made this report possible. I just dropped the link that you can download the report um, into the chat. So please download that and read that. Um, it is absolutely incredible. So I would like to thank Narrative Change uh, for helping us put that report together. Wallace Global Fund, of course, the First Do No Harm campaign, uh, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, Stand Earth, and the Climate Safe Pensions Network. Next slide. All right, I'm very excited to introduce one of my very favorite humans um, on this planet, Tom Sanzillo. Um, he is the Director of Financial Analysis for IEFA. He has produced influential studies on the oil, gas, petrochemical, and coal sectors in the US and internationally, including company and credit analysis, facility development, oil and gas reserves, and fight, <coughs> excuse me, and commodity market analysis and public and private financial structures. He also examines such areas as community and shareholder activism, institutional investment, public subsidies, and Puerto Rico's energy economics. Uh, thank you and welcome, Tom Sanzillo. Uh, thanks, Amy, and thanks, Don, for the uh, uh, overview of the report. Um, Every industry now is taking a look at them, how they relate um, and, and how they're um, addressing climate change, whether it's finance or retail or um, the pharmaceuticals or utilities or insurance and telecommunications. Um, and as Don said, the, uh, the medical um, field is no different. The, the uh, number of projects, particularly in the procurement space for buying uh, products for hospitals and health facilities are trying to reduce some um, the fossil fuels and plastics use there. These are major, very important uh, initiatives that need to continue. But every industry also has a financial infrastructure and just like the budgets and the investment programs that you know, are for capital programs for hospitals or pension funds for the workers, um, these funds are run in the hundreds of billions, as Don said, and that most of the investments are um, are uh, also looking at ways to deal with them um, with climate change. Um, and it's a way to think about moving large sums of money uh, from the uh, current fossil fuel um, economy and to align them with uh, align those dollars with what's what's going on in the broader economy, which is a, a growing uh, series of investments in sustainability. Um, 1,500 institutional investors around the world have divested in some degree from fossil fuels. Um, and these funds, they're large funds and they're small funds, uh, they found a pathway to reduce their holdings in fossil fuels uh, so that they um, can make investments that are um, consistent with the philosophy of the, of the organizations. And in this instance, we're talking about health organizations and consistent with the size of the fund and consistent with the strategy for decarbonization that we're, we're talking about. These are large, um, complicated um, questions, um, and they're largely dealt with as environmental or climate issues and moral issues. But I wanna to talk to you a little bit about is that there are financial underpinnings in um, right now around the fo fossil fuel industry that make it essential for any fiduciary who is responsible for these funds to really consider um, you know, moving out of fossil fuels and for developing plans um, uh, to do that. What's little known about the fossil fuel sector is that they were once the largest contributors of profit to most institutional funds in the world. I was in, involved with running the state of New York's finances for many years and we relied upon them. Their contributions to the financial markets are no longer robust. Um, they have been declining. Um, for most of the last decade before Vladimir Putin inv invaded Ukraine, they were uh, at or near last place in the stock market. The, uh, from 2021 to 2022, they did a little better because the price of oil went up due to the, um, due to the invasion and due to the end of, uh, end of COVID. But now um, the markets, uh, unfortunately, are uh, for the fossil fuel industry are beginning to level back out. And they are again in last place as we speak, or near last place since January of this year. 
Um, that's what's been happening for 10 years and even longer. In 1980, the fossil fuel sector um, commanded 28% of the stock market. That's 28%. Today, it's under 5%. And before the invasion, it was at 2%. So they have lost considerable amounts of value. And yet many in the industry still look at them as, some, as an entity that will turn around. Well, if you look deeply at the, at the um, position of the oil and gas sector, you see many historically unprecedented factors that they are confronting. Um, never have they uh, uh, confronted competition in the, um, in the uh, automobile sector, refinery of gasoline, in the power plants sector with natural gas and in the petrochemical sector. Um, they've, they, we now face in the industry, uh, now faces um, a, ma a massive build out of electric vehicles, which they now are acknowledging will have a major impact on their future. Um, we're looking at wind and solar and energy all over the world having an impact on natural gas investments. We're seeing in every country in the world, every large country except the United States, a pretty big conversation about reducing the level of uh, plastics in the economy, which are, um, which are made out of um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, these are enormous changes. And in the coal sector, particularly in the United States, they've lost 50% of their market shares um, since uh, 2007. These are uh, substantial reductions in the, um, uh, in, the, um, in the market share of the industry, and it has depressed the profits to the point where an industry that was once leading um, the world economy is now finding itself near um, or in the last place in the um, in the uh, in the economy, um, similarly, we're seeing that the um, the countries that are uh, um, uh, heavily oil dependent are becoming increasingly desperate, and I think you could see maybe that level of desperation in the invasion of Ukraine, um, and that is a substantial um, evidence of the fact that these countries are trying these countries that are dependent on oil and gas are trying to maintain those revenues and they will take extraordinary efforts uh, um, to maintain that. Their profits for the oil and gas sector are unsustainable and their future is on shaky ground and it, it faces a future um, where they're going to be supplying less oil and gas to fewer customers. And that means lower profits and a less robust um, profitability. Um, today, you're going to hear um, and have heard a little bit about the four um, major um, health systems um, uh, that are, are involved. They have exposure to these um, uh, oil and gas companies, or what we call carbon exposure, and um, and they by identifying them, we begin to find a way out. And there are many, many ways to find out out of fossil fuels. The, the report is a start, and it really is an invitation to the industries to build on the, the um, programs that they already have and to extend it to their investments. And in many ways, it couldn't come at a, a better time um, for them. Um, over the last decade, I've been doing this for a while, and I would say for the last you know five or six years, um, the industry has seen a massive um, 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 move from in the financial markets away from fossil fuels. So you'll find Vanguard, um, you'll find Fidelity and BlackRock all have major uh, new investment products that big institutional investors like these hospitals can put their money into safely and to um, make the profits that they need to make in order to um, pay their retirement obligations and make sure the hospitals are kept up in terms of their capital programs um, and indexed investments in, uh, in, uh, in stock market, index investments in bonds, um, new approaches to uh, private equity, which are higher risk investments. Um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these were um, um, not available um, to large institutional investors, but now they are and they can absorb large amounts of money while reducing um, emissions. And that's really the key. 
to what we're talking about. Um, the fiduciary interest of these funds um, nowadays are really um, to come up with divestment plans uh, um, um, work with their uh, investment professionals. All of these hospital systems have um, very um, well-qualified pro uh, investment professionals working for them and under contract to develop a plan that would allow them to move prudently towards um, divestment. And I guess I want to end um, where I started, um, which is today the oil and gas sector is in a it's in a pitched battle for last place in the stock market. And all of the evidence is, is that this is not going to turn around. There may be uh, periods when extraordinary activities like a war um, will, will um, um, push up prices and temporarily stock prices. But overall, the industry is failing financially and has been failing financially. And I hope today um, starts as the first step for the health industry to really begin to address the financial issues involved with um, fossil fuels as much as they have been on their operational side. So thanks. Thank you, Tom, so much. So well put. And we are so grateful to have had Tom here to talk to us today. Um, we are going to be uh, moving on and I'm sharing the report while we're doing this. Um, next up, I am very excited um, to introduce uh, Dr. Maria Zlatnik. Uh, Dr. Zlatnik is an MD, MMS, is, and is a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at UCSF and a collaborator at UCSF's program in reproductive health and the environment. She is a maternal fetal medicine specialist with clinical expertise in ultrasound and the diagnosis of fetal anomalies. She has long been interested in environmental contributor to reproductive and fetal health and collaborates with both the Western States Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit and the UCSF Environmental Research and Translation for Health Earth Center. She is also highly active in climate change and decarbonization efforts within healthcare. Welcome, Dr. Zlatnik. Thank you, Amy, for that kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, next slide, please. So what I'd like to talk about is the impact of climate change on reproduction and pregnancy, and then briefly talk about how fossil fuels feed both climate change and chem chemical contamination of people, and then to uh, introduce the concept of health benefits from decarbonization. Next slide, please. If anyone is interested in more information specifically about pregnancy, uh, one of our UCSF medical students, Winnie Fan, just published a review of climate change in pregnancy uh, just this month. So I show this image to start off with both because I think this is the image that many of us have about climate change in that it's sort of happening somewhere else. But also in reference to pregnancy, when we think about the impacts of climate change, there's sort of the macro level. So if we imagine one of the people in this photo to be pregnant, we can easily see how climate change and the resultant flood, it could impact the pregnancy. Um, next slide, please. But when we think more about the United States, we still can see the impact of disasters and as I, as I continue, we'll talk a little bit sort of on a more and more granular level about the impacts in pregnancy. So this photo is actually from flooding in 2017. In this same spot um, this January, there was again a flood which closed uh, Highway 101 in California. So if I saw a, a pregnant person who needed specialist care at um, UCSF or Stanford in the Bay Area, and she lived a couple hours south, she would not have been able to easily get to the hospital. Or vice versa, if somebody lived just north of this flooding in Gilroy and needed to go to the lo local hospital to have uh, her baby, she would have been in, in, in trouble. So we can see just the fact that when there's a disaster, we have disruption of medical services. But beyond that, the stress of uh, an event like this 
has been associated with decreased birth weight, with actually neurodevelopmental impacts on the offspring, and increases in maternal and neonatal morbidity. Next slide, please. We can also see impacts on pregnancy from uh, sort of less disaster type impacts um, and more just the day-to-day -day of a changing climate. So when it comes to high heat, the physiology of pregnancy uh, puts people at risk. So this is a little bit of a simplification, but pregnant women are in a very metabolic state. They're breathing more, they're consuming more oxygen, their heart is working harder. The fetus and the placenta are generating heat inside the body of the pregnant person. And so this makes a pregnant person more susceptible to the health harms from high heat. Next slide, please. And when we see, when we uh, look at the impacts of heat waves and higher heat, there is a large and growing body of literature associating high heat with pregnancy complications. So shorter pregnancies, preterm birth have all been uh, noted in many studies with heat waves or even just higher than average or higher than typical temperatures. Next slide, please. We can also see impacts on pregnancy specifically from wildfire smoke or air pollution. So this could be both a climate change fueled wildfire or this could be roadway pollution from fossil fuel con combustion in, ca in cars and trucks. Um, and the body of literature looking at air pollution and harms to pregnancy, including preterm birth and fetal growth restriction is, is huge. There's a huge international body of work. When looking specifically at air pollution from wildfire smoke, this body of literature is smaller, but growing rapidly. And so again, we're seeing uh, concerns about fetal growth restriction and preterm birth, which is one of the biggest causes of neonatal morbidity and mortality that we know of. So um, this study by ABDO, which was published a few years ago, uh, based on their data, they modeled that a pregnant person whose second trimester of pregnancy happened to be in peak wildfire season in Colorado, in a typical Colorado wildfire season, um, she would have a 7% increased odds of preterm birth. Next slide, please. Um, so clearly climate change and the roles that fossil fuels play in climate change, as well as in um, creating air pollution cause important harms to pregnancy. But there are also other ways that fossil fuel extraction can lead to harms in pregnancy. And I'm just gonna touch on this briefly because it's a, it's a complex issue, but I think it's important to understand. So if we look at sort of the right half of this diagram, that's what we've been talking about so far. But if fossil fuels are not used to be burned as fuel, if they are instead used by the petrochemical industry to make plastics and other chemicals, then unfortunately that, that is also a way in which pregnancy and pregnant people can be harmed. So unfortunately, a number of these chemicals um, that are used in plastics are what are known as endocrine disrupting chemicals. So these are chemicals that mimic hormones. So they have estrogen-like effects or other hormonal impacts in the body. And these have been shown to have impacts on people broadly. So they, they raise the risk of diabetes and obesity, but in pregnancy specifically, um, some risks including prematurity. Next slide, please. Um, so this is sort of a, a little bit snarky, but two ways to make hormones. There's the natural way that the body does, which is very finely tuned, particularly when it comes to reproduction. And then there's the way that the petrochemical industry makes hormones, which is um, not quite so healthy. Next slide, please. So how do we see these harms impacting uh, pregnant people? In California, where I live, we see a epidemic of preterm birth in the Central Valley. 
uh, including Fresno County. And this is an area of the state that has been impacted by um, many things. It has uh, lots of pesticides from the agricultural industry. It is a hotter area historically, made even hotter by climate change and has poor air quality from, uh, from trucks, et cetera. And we see that there's a higher risk of preterm birth in the Central Valley, especially among women of color. And the more, um, the more environmental harm as measured by something called Cal and virus screen that an individual is exposed to, the higher the risk of preterm birth for that person. Next slide. So there are things that we can do. And if you look at this graphic, it's showing the benefit to um, decarbonization and improving health would actually impact those people who live in um, the worst areas when it comes to air pollution would receive the greatest benefit from decarbonization. So whether that is electrifying buildings or vehicles, um, we can see an improvement immediately in air quality, which can lead to health co-benefits. And again, those in the most disadvantaged census tracts are expected to receive the, the most health benefits. Next slide, please. And research has actually shown this specifically related to pregnancy. So again, in another study out of, out of California, where over several years, a variety of coal and oil power plants were closed. And in the areas immediately surrounding those plants, there was a decreased risk of preterm birth. So an important health benefit uh, related to pregnancy with closing of these power plants. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, pregnancies are vulnerable to harm from climate change and fossil fuel pollution, as well as endocrine disruption from petrochemicals and plastic. And we can see health benefits, especially to pregnant people from decarbonization. If anyone is interested in, in specific uh, advice that can be given to pregnant people in preparing for climate change, please see this fact sheet, uh, either through the QR code or this link. Uh, which has more advice uh, to help people stay healthy. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so very much for that. Um, I just learned so much, and I hope everyone else did too, on how those uh, climate effects really hit our human bodies. Um, I'm very excited to introduce next um, Dr. Tess Carter. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow at George Washington University, working on several projects, including characterizing the environmental justice impacts of parts per million 2.5 and integrating health risks into analysis of federal climate policies. She earned her PhD in atmospheric chemistry from MIT, where she worked on fires and how their smoke impacts air quality, and the climate, and a BS in chemistry from Brown University. Prior to graduate school, she worked on the National Climate Assessment for several years. Welcome, Dr. Carter. Awesome. Thanks so much. You can go to the next slide. Um, it's really great to follow Dr. Zlotnick, um, because in this presentation, I'll be talking about a lot of work um, in the group I'm in at GW, looking at the health impacts and inequities of air pollution and climate change, so building out um, beyond pregnancy some of the other impacts that we see. Um, and we use a lot of different satellite data sets to both help characterize the problem and then help um, provide some solutions as well. So you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so air pollution continues to be a leading health risk factor in nearly all countries. And what this plot is showing, these are not just environmental risk factors, these are all health risk factors. Um, and air pollution is the fourth leading cause, um, leading to, to almost 7 million um, deaths across across the globe in 2019, and it's a large factor for, for several different um, large health risk factors as well, as you can see below. Um, you can go to the next slide. So we're talking about climate change in this uh, webinar, and in fact, climate change worsens air quality in several, several ways. So you can see on the top left um, that it exacerbates ozone exposure, so that smog that we see in a lot of these large cities um, it increases wildfire smoke. So this is what I just spent the last five years focused on. Um, and we see sort of these increasingly catastrophic fires um, in the Western US that have been tied um, to climate change. 
the top right is showing increased dust um, from increased aridity and other um, human-led factors. Uh, I don't know if you can tell that I sound very nasally, but we can also see that climate change is worsening allergy conditions. Um, I'm sitting in DC right now and there's been work showing that it's one of the worst allergy seasons um, ever. And then as we're coming out of a pandemic, uh, we can also talk about how um, climate change has worsened airborne infectious disease. Next slide, please. Um, so as I was mentioning, climate change worsens air pollution health risks um, in several ways. And this is a paper that came out of our group um, showing that there are synergistic health effects of air pollution, temperature, and, and pollen exposure. Um, and basically that um, increases in temperature um, has sort of a, a more than one plus one um, effect on, on air pollution health risks. Um, next slide. So in addition, we're talking a lot about economics in this webinar, and in fact, the economic value of air pollution health impacts is among the largest damages from climate change. Um, so there are several papers that we're showing on the left here that folks in our group have been involved with, including the fourth national climate assessment. Um, the fifth is underway. Uh, I was mentioning dust um, and aridity. We've shown that there's increasing aridity um, leading to, to large health impacts in the US Southwest under climate change. Um, then there's also been a lot of work in our group and elsewhere looking at uh, future wildfire emissions leading to, to premature mortality and morbidity. Um, and then these different, these different circles on the right hand side are showing um, just some of the effects that um, air pollution health impacts um, are leading to in terms of economic damages. And as I've been talking about wildfire, uh, PM 2.5 or particulate matter under two and a half microns is a really large um, health impact. And then there's associated um, damages with that. Next slide, please. So one of the reasons we talk about climate change and air pollution in sort of the same sentence is they share a lot of common sources. Um, so Dr. Zlotnick was talking about this in the previous presentation, but a lot of these different gas and particle phase emissions that lead to bad air quality are also contributing to climate change in a lot of um, interesting and somewhat complicated ways. And so if we focus on these source emissions, um, we can improve both air pollution um, and decrease some of um, climate change impacts at the same time. And so it's really important to be thinking about these two in tandem. There's also some complicated feedbacks um, that we need to be thinking about in terms of sort of management plans. Next slide, please. Um, so this has a lot of different plots and, and it's sort of um, alluding to the fact that the urban context, which is where um, the majority of people live in the US um, and in you know, large megacities across the world is, is a complicated place and leads to a lot of societal challenges in this context. Um, so if we sort of start on the right uh, with population growth, we can see that the world population has increased um, and will continue to increase through at least 2050 and that the urban population um, is, is growing and is a large component of that. Um, going back to the left-hand side of this plot, sorry about that, uh, we can see that there's poor air quality um, centered in a lot of these cities in the US. You can see, you know, for example, LA and San Francisco popping out, New York, Chicago, et cetera. Um, and so those red hotspots are um, information coming from a satellite, and I'll talk about that satellite in a second. Um, and then associated with these large, uh, you know, air quality and population dense areas, there's CO2 emissions growth um, increasing. So the C40 cities are, are 40 cities across the world looking at addressing climate change um, that also have really large emissions. And then we sort of bring all of this together um, to think about health inequalities in cities. And I'll talk about this in more depth in a second, but what we're showing here is DC, which is where um, we're sitting. And so we work with um, environmental and government groups here to help understand um, in, in this report in particular, how pediatric asthma emergency department visits are increasing and how that's different in different parts of the city and how that might be associated uh, both with air pollution um, and the sources of that, for example, through fossil fuel combustion, and then also um, the sort of existing, pre-existing health conditions in the population that would be leading to some of these disparities as well. Next slide, please. Um, so this is going a little bit more in depth in one of those studies that we um, led out of our group, Maria Castillo led this work, um, showing that in, in DC in particular, um, if you're familiar with this sort of the um, Northwest and Western parts of the city um, are, are predominantly white and, and higher income. And we see 
um, lower air pollution burdens there relative to these, these blues you can see on sort of the eastern part of the city uh, where PM 2.5 related mortality rates are elevated. And this is also where the majority of, of black residents live. Um, and I should just add that this information is coming from, from satellite data. Um, and we use a lot of that in, in our lab. Next slide, please. Um, speaking of satellite data, why do we use it? It's spatially complete. Uh, it lets us sort of look across the globe and get um, beyond a snapshot. It gives us good spatial and temporal resolution. It's high resolution, so we can get down to, to um, a kilometer or sometimes less in terms of um, the sort of spatial footprint. Um, and it's semi-observational, which is, which is really useful. And then we can compare that against models and estimates that we come up with in other ways. Um, so that image I was showing of the U.S. before um, was coming from this Tripomi sensor that looks at NO2. A lot of work in our, our lab has been led by Dan Goldberg, um, who does a lot of this work. And again, so this is blown out to, to look at the whole globe. We can see um, large cities and, and populated areas, um, again, showing up in the satellite image. Next slide, please. And we see that popping out. Again, going back to a similar plot of the US, um, because NO2 is a really good high resolution tracer for urban traffic and the fossil fuel combustion associated with that. Um, these NOx emissions are precursors for PM 2.5 and ozone, which are the two largest contributors to smog. Um, and then NO2 is also associated with asthma development. So it lets us sort of come um, complete the sort of trajectory from fossil fuel combustion um, to health impacts. And then um, satellite NO2 columns, that's what we're showing here, highly correlated with ground level concentrations. Um, so satellites are seeing the entire column right from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. Um, but in, with this particular pollutant, there's a lot of work showing that that um, correlates well with what people are actually experiencing. So it's a good satellite observation to use in this space. Next slide, please. Um, and then, to, to take this work sort of to health disparities, um, what this work was showing led by Gage Kerr in our group is that the COVID-19 lockdowns, when there was a lot less, um, for example, traffic on the road, did not eliminate um, satellite Tripomi NO2 disparities. And so what this plot is showing is all census tracts in the US um, and then those subdivided by rural, urban and some of the largest um, US cities as well. And what you can see across the board is that least white census tracts were exposed um, to, to more pollution um, across the board. And that even with the 2020 lockdowns where we had less of that anthropogenic or human driven um, pollution that we still saw disparities between the least white and most white communities. Next slide, please. If we do that same sort of analysis across time, um, so now NO2, what I was talking about before is on the right hand side and then PM 2.5 particulate matter under two and a half microns is on the left. Um, the colors are, are still somewhat similar to before. So the most white tracks are in, in orange and least white are in that dark blue color. Um, and what's good is that we see air pollution is coming down over the last 20 years, or sorry, 10 years or so, which is what we would expect. But what the, the open circles on the bottom are showing is that the disparity between the most and least white uh, health burdens is actually widening. So that number is increasing over time, um, which means that we need to do more. Um, to address these health disparities um, coming from pollution. Next slide, please. This is some work that I led um, that's under review right now. And so what we did here is we used different um, data inputs or estimates of PM 2.5, uh, mostly coming from satellites, but other um, observational estimates as well. Um, and what we showed is that these three different data sets agreed um, across the US where these black dots are in terms of um, disadvantaged communities due to air pollution. So that's using a um, low income marker in addition to high pollution exposure. But then in orange, we were looking at some high resolution data sets um, that have come out recently and they pick up um, some additional locations, particularly in the outskirts of Los Angeles and Atlanta. Um, and then this CMAC F or CMAC fusion product in blue is what EPA and other parts of the federal government use to identify these disadvantaged communities and to direct resources towards them. And so they're identifying additional um, census tracts that are disadvantaged here in blue, but they're not picking up on a lot of, on, and, sorry, on any of those orange um, dots, which these higher resolution data sets are. 
And so if we want to sort of think about what these census tract means, uh, mean in terms of people, right, like census tracts is kind of a, an abstract idea. People don't necessarily know what that means. Um, there's about four and a half million people that all of these different data sets identify as disadvantaged due to air pollution. There's an additional one and a half million people identified as disadvantaged using high resolution data sets. Um, and then about 3 million people identified as disadvantaged in this uh, coarser resolution data set here represented in blue that the federal government uses to direct resources, um, but that are not identified in higher resolution data sets. Next slide, please. Um, so back to what I was saying before, since climate change and air pollution share common sources, uh, we can characterize them in similar ways, um, potentially using you know, satellites like I was talking about. Um, but that also means that we can then address them um, in related manners. So next slide, please. Um, and that we should be thinking about them in concert, right? So we should be integrating air quality and health into urban climate action planning. This is work um, that was done. I mentioned the C40 cities before. This is work that was done um, by our lab in collaboration with many others to focus on greenhouse gas, GHG emissions, and PM2.5 emissions at the same time. They have a lot of similar sources. As you can see here, road traffic, buildings, industry are some of those largest contributors. And so it's really important to be talking about um, these two um, important health aspects at the same time. Next slide, please. Um, and so I think this is one of my final slides, but this is just a, um, some other work led by Maria Castillos and others at GW, um, showing that there are multiple pathways of health benefits from climate action. Um, as I was just saying, greenhouse gas mitigation actions can focus on large sectors or large sources um, that we, we need to care about. Um, and there's different exposure health pathways. So I've been talking a lot about air pollution. Our group has also been looking at green spaces and how um, access to green spaces can uh, be sort of a preventative health measure or, or lead to better health outcomes. Um, noise can be a big thing as well, physical activity and many others. Um, and then the, these lead to health benefits um, in, in several different ways. As Dr. Zlotnick was talking about, there's um, important implications for reproductive health outcomes, but we talk a lot about um, in the air pollution world, respiratory and cardiovascular disease, um, all-cause mortality, and I think recently there's been more of an emphasis on mental health outcomes as well, um, especially in the climate space. So next slide, please. So just to uh, reiterate really quickly, climate change is worsening air pollution, which is already a leading risk factor contributing to mortality globally in the U.S. with really large um, both health and, and financial burdens. I showed just a few um, snapshots of novel geospatial data and assessment tools that have um, allowed us to provide actionable information and assess and mitigate air pollution health impacts broadly. Disparities in air pollution concentrations and health risks are, are growing, um, but improved information such as from satellites can enhance our management abilities um, to deal with both air quality and climate simultaneously. Um, and then I think next slide is my final just acknowledgement slide. Um, there's funding from a huge variety of sources that has um, supported this work, many, many collaborators. Um, and, and the group that I've been talking a lot about is led by Susan Annenberg um, at GW. So uh, one final plug for developers of open access data sets, um, this work wouldn't have been possible without that. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. That was so incredible and informative, and I hope folks are learning so much because I know that I am. Uh, next up, I'm excited to introduce Savita Putarazu. Savita is driven to help protect our biggest playground. As an avid outdoor enthusiast, she recognizes both the positive benefits of green spaces on physical and mental health, as well as the disproportionate harms of our changing climate on human health. As the current executive chair for Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, in her second term, she is committed to promoting environmental justice and the climate action initiatives this organization undertakes. She is an MD, MPH student at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences and has co-led the newly established Climate Change and Human Health MD program curriculum theme with Taylor Brewer, one of this year's vice chairs. Welcome, Savita. Thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, next slide, please. So we've heard a lot about kind of the health impacts of poor air quality, of fossil fuel use. And today I'm going to be shedding light on the role of students, learners, trainees, 
in this space and how potentially you at your institutions could support student-led initiatives. Um, so I do lead Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, or MS4SF, and we kind of have different domains that our team works in, ranging from advocacy, curriculum, research, et cetera. Um, today, I'm mainly going to be talking about advocacy and climate smart healthcare, particularly um, with the release of this new report and how our initiatives might overlap. Next slide, please. A little bit about the magnitude of the impact that, of the work that we do as medical students. Um, we are a national and global organization founded about uh, three years ago. Um, and our network has more than 700 students across the world where we have a presence at more than 150 medical schools, 36 states, 10 plus countries. So we are an ever growing community. Um, next slide, please. And we look forward to having all of your support as we move forward. So a little bit about climate smart healthcare. First and foremost, we promote knowledge and awareness of the health system contributions to human induced or anthropogenic climate change, as well as the impetus for fossil fuel divestment and kind of what that means for the work that we do in our day to day, um, as well as for our patients. A new avenue we have been exploring is resource sharing for individual hospital systems regarding lead certifications, um, which is a very, very new initiative that we have undertaken. When relating to hospital system and policy advocacy, we have been develop developing approaches for our member students um, and chapters to help establish sustainability managers at their home institutions. Um, some of our members have had success in doing this, and so we're trying to standardize ways um, and toolkits for our other chapters to be able to do so as well. We, as an organization, have signed on to a variety of pledges and initiatives, including the health sector pledge through HHS, um, as well as through Physicians for Social Responsibility regarding fossil fuel divestment, and we are very proud of our stance on this issue. Um, we would not be the organization that we are without our mentorship and partnerships um, with Healthcare Without Harm, Practice Green Health, the Medical Society Consortium, um, that these organizations really include student voices um, and Stand Earth, and we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, have a voice and a seat at the table. The last thing I'll kind of talk about is a specific initiative um, called the Climate Smart Healthcare Project Guide. Um, next slide, please. That is kind of a toolkit um, and informational resource for our members to be able to start their own institutional um, specific projects, and we have some case studies of other uh, chapters that have been successful in potentially getting sustainability managers, lead certifications, um, fossil fuel divestment commitment, um, things like that. So that's just one specific example and one of many examples that we have as an organization. Um, and I'm so happy to be here and share more about this. Um, next slide, please. And I'd just like to conclude um, with our stance on divestment, one, as a justice issue, and two, as a health issue. As learners and trainees, we are critical advocates as we enter the healthcare workforce. Um, we live and breathe hospital systems, especially in our third and fourth years and going into residency. So we do see kind of what our contributions to environmental degradation are, whether that be waste or energy. Um, and we definitely believe that divestment is a priority in our health sector. We support adaptation and mitigation strategies. As we've been hearing, um, we are already experiencing generations worth of consequences of using fossil fuels to power our health systems. And um, we have a responsibility for future generations to mitigate these risks um, and commit to divestment. So we stand for health systems that protect our planet and our most vulnerable patients um, and really appreciate the support of this community that we have today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Savita, for being here and thank you for the support. This is incredible. Um, and we should all, I just followed them on Twitter. Everyone else should as well. I put it in uh, the chat. Um, all right, we're gonna take a little, little sidetrack off, off the health impacts and we're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about some Marissa stuff and some fiduciary duty uh, from one of my absolute favorite people. Um, please welcome Stephen. Uh, Stephen is 
a, an attorney um, at the Center for International Environmental Law for their climate and energy program. Stephen's work focuses primarily on climate liability and finance. Stephen specializes in developing legal strategies to hold fossil fuel companies accountable for the impacts of climate change and for failures to acknowledge climate risks, as well as works on issues of securities law and finance to accelerate the incorporation of climate risk into financial markets and disclosures. He was a primary author of CL's Trillion Dollar Transformation Reports. Excellent report. You should read it. Um, he was a primary author of that, um, outlining the fiduciary and financial risks of climate change to pension fund fiduciaries. Um, he is also one of the primary researchers and authors of Smoke and Fumes Project, a public documentation of the early history of the oil industry. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve, for, to Stephen, to blow your mind. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. Um, next slide, please. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, as Amy said, my name is Stephen Fight. I'm here to talk about climate change, ERISA, and fiduciary duties, and kind of talk through the uh, legal framework under which this this conversation and this you know um, demand for divestment sits. Um, I also uh, apologize in advance. I, I typically make presentations with lots of pictures in them, but it's hard to talk about financial regulation through pictures. So there is a lot of text. Um, so with that caveat, uh, please next slide. So the fiduciary duty basics, private pension funds, uh, are governed by federal law. There's the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, that you may or may not have heard of. Um, and public pensions are governed by state law. There's a bunch of different versions of what's essentially the Uniform Prudent Investor Act, or UPIA. Um, and I, I bring this up because, you know, talking about private health systems and their pensions, we're really talking about ERISA. We're talking about um, a particular a uh, federal legal regime, but there are enormous, enormous similarities between public and private pension regulation. There's actually also similarities between regulation of charities, which include things like universities, which are under UPMIFA, the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, um, and has a similar but distinct structure to UPIA. And I bring all that up to say that this is not a conversation happening in a vacuum. This is, um, intimately and, and um, legally connected to the divestment efforts at public pension funds and at colleges and universities and other charities. It's all, it's all connected. So with that said, pension fund managers, so fiduciaries and trustees, they are bound by fiduciary duties, which are legal requirements um, that, that govern their behavior. The main two branches are the duties of prudence and duties of loyalty. Essentially, you have to um, act with care um, and, and take a professional approach to managing um, a fund, and you need to act in the best interest of your beneficiaries. And critically, fiduciary duties can compel action or they can prevent action. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So in ERISA, section 4.0, 404A is, is the, the section that enumerates the fiduciary duties um, that private sector pension fund trustees um, and fiduciaries are held to. They include, as we said, the duty of loyalty, the exclusive purpose rule, uh, the prudent person rule, diversification rule, uh, and the duty of follow plan documents. And we'll, we'll come back to these sort of later. Um, next slide, please. Similarly, the fiduciary duties found in UPIA are articulated in somewhat different uh, words, but, but are really quite similar and, and operate in parallel. There is the prudent investor rule, the standard of care, diversification, loyalty, and impartiality. And so, next slide, please. With this background, several years ago, uh, we wrote this report in, in collaboration with Mercer, the uh, investment consultancy. Um, where Mercer analyzed the performance of a public sector defined benefit pension fund in uh, several different climate scenarios. And you, building on that, we undertook an analysis of how the enumerated fiduciary duties um, that pension fund trustees are subject to are implicated by different forms of climate or, or by climate related financial risk. Next slide, please. And 
and essentially what we found is that they basically all are. Climate-related financial risk is a significant and material financial risk. And as such, pension fund uh, fiduciaries are obligated to take those risks under consideration. And we can break down some of the um, some of the specific duties as enumerated and how they're implicated by that risk. So the duty to monitor requires uh, fiduciaries to stay updated on major um, to, to, to continuously monitor their portfolio to ensure that um, their particular investments and their investment strategy remain appropriate in light of evolving circumstances, including major political, legal, technological, and other developments. Um, there's the duty to diversify, which I, I particularly want to to talk about for a second, because it's often used as a um, a justification for failing to divest, right? So the duty to diversify comes from, it grows out of modern portfolio theory and this idea that to operate, uh, to prudently operate a pension fund, one has to invest in a broad array of kinds of investments so that even if one thing is particularly risky, it, it kind of smooths it out over the course of the portfolio. And this really grows out of this idea that fiduciaries are obligated to, at the same time, try to improve returns while minimizing risks and minimizing correlated risks. The problem is, is really twofold. One is that it's extremely possible to maintain a diversified portfolio, even eliminating the entire fossil fuel sector. At the same time, climate change itself is a large and correlated risk that's concentrated in that sector. So the the entire theory by which the duty to diversify emerges counsels, I would argue, in favor of divestment. There's also a duty of impartiality, where fiduciaries are required to consider the interests of all beneficiaries. And critically, this includes the young. This means that you can't be, you have to be impartial between generations of beneficiaries. And, and I think the, the connection to climate-related financial risk is quite clear, um, given the the nature of climate change, the, the distribution in time of the impacts and the effects and the, the way in which investments in fossil fuels today um, really disproportionately impact future beneficiaries. Finally, and this is important to note, um, there's also a duty to act in accordance with plan documents. Anything else that the uh, uh, organizing bylaws or rules or policies of a particular fund requires, as long as it's consistent with all the other uh, requirements of ERISA, that fund is obligated to do. And so the upshot of all of this is that in a warming world where the climate crisis is mounting, prudent investment requires attention to the risks that climate change pose to portfolio assets. Full stop. Next slide, please. So, I want to now kind of zero in on particularly the Department of Labor and their perspectives on ESG investing under ERISA, because it's on the one hand evolved quite a bit over time, but on the other hand, very, very little has changed. And I think that's really the point. So there have been six major instances where the Department of Labor, which in uh, because ERISA is employment law, um, and even though this is about, you know, investing, the Department of Labor is the um, regulatory body that oversees ERISA, including the um, investment practices of ERISA funds. So in 1994, there was the first Department of Labor guidance that expressly permitted what at the time was called economically targeted investing. Um, several years later, there was another guidance that warned against what they called investing for collateral benefits. It's important to note, in both of these cases, the, the understanding and the interpretation of the law was the same, that if your investment returns were going to be basically the same either way, you could invest for, you know, at the time, economically targeted investing or for collateral benefits for something other than risk and return, um, if, if it was all things being equal. The difference was that the 1994 guidance uh, went out of its way to say you can do that. The 2008 guidance went out of its way to say, you can do that, but it better be, you know, it better not be for that reason only. In 2015, 
2018, the Department of Labor released another document acknowledging that ESG risks are actually financial risks, and that not only could you invest um, for these, you know, economically targeted purposes or for collateral benefits, but that these risks might actually affect financial returns. And then in 2018, the Department of Labor released guidance expressing skepticism, saying, well, you can do it if you can really do it, but it better not be for these other reasons. In 2020, the Department of Labor then issued a rule that actually put some significant legal restrictions and additional requirements on ESG investing by ERISA funds, which uh, was not enforced. And then in 2022, the uh, Department of Labor issued a new rule lifting restrictions and lifting those additional requirements on ESG investing. So it looks like, you know, there's been this ping ponging back and forth of uh, fighting over what's permitted under ERISA, but the actual substance of the law has really not changed. And, and I want to kind of talk about the two tracks and how, um, how what we're arguing for now is really the same as it's been for, you know, almost the last 30 years. So there's this one question of what can you do if you're looking at two investment options that seem basically the same? One of them has other non-financial benefits that, that you might be interested in, um, whether it's environmental benefits, sustainability, social, whatever. And it has long been the rule, it's called the all else being equal test, that if you have two equal investment opportunities, choose the one that's better socially, economically, what have you, or environmentally, what have you. Um, the various guidances simply put a um, put put a, a an emphasis on one part of that equation, right? Saying um, yes, this is permitted. Just make sure that you're doing the proper financial analysis. The other one saying, you know, really make sure you're doing the proper financial analysis. But if you are, this is permitted. The next track is really about this question of what's you know coming to be termed among other things, ESG integration, basically the understanding that um, the broad suite of risks, but, but in particular climate related financial risk is a real financial risk and that uh, funds perform better when they incorporate these risks and invest accordingly. And again, you have this ping ponging of emphasis where the understanding has always been if there is a material financial risk, it is appropriate and in fact required that pension fund fiduciaries consider it when putting together an investment strategy. And so whether, so, so in nearly 30, uh, or yeah, in nearly 30 years of ping ponging back and forth, the fundamental rules have not changed. And so that brings us to the question of what is the situation? I mean, we heard it from Tom, AIFA has been doing incredible work on this. We've seen this coming from major investment consultancies like Mercer, like BlackRock, like Makeda, that ultimately fossil fuel divestment is at worst neutral and seems to have a positive impact on the portfolio in the present, setting aside this question of the long-term risks, the significant uh, damage that climate change can do to uh, fund assets and the question of impartiality between current and future beneficiaries, which again brings us back to this, this upshot that in a warming world where the climate crisis is mounting, prudent investment requires attention to risks that climate change pose to portfolio assets. And as we can see, it has for over 30 years. With that, thank you. I love that. Thank you, Stephen, so much. I every time Stephen speaks, I learn so much. Um, I hope that helped like other folks, like how we navigate this space um, and getting our pensions to divest. Um, next up, oh, I'm very excited to introduce my friend Marjane Molini. Um, Dr. Molini is currently serves on the board of the San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility um, and is the co-chair of the Environmental Health Committee. Um, at the San Francisco Bay PSR. Um, she's passionate about health equity and environmental justice and works very closely with several community advocacy groups and environmental justice organizations. She is also passionate about supporting our youth in their environment, environmental health activism and mentoring medical students and residents. Um, welcome. 
Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm on the board of um, National Board of Physicians for Social Responsibility and the chair of Emerging Leaders Committee at PSR as well, and co-author of the Health Professionals Call for uh, Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Next slide, please. Um, so health professionals are calling for fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, a call that has been endorsed by World Health Organization, more than 200 health organizations, growing numbers of countries, cities, scientists, Nobel Prize winners, faith leaders, and individuals. So the main pillars of fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, treaty is that we want to end any new fossil fuel infrastructure and production, we want to phase out existing production of fossil fuels, and we want to fast track real solutions and make sure we make this uh, transition through a just transition. May I have the next slide? The reason we're doing this is because of health harms of fossil fuel operations. So the first two pillars of uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty are to stop uh, any new operations and seize existing operations because fossil fuels at every step of the way uh, in their operations from extraction to transport to uh, usage actually create health harms. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Carter and Dr. Zlatnik spoke about health harms from uh, air pollution. So fossil fuel uh, production and use is uh, the leading cause of air pollution uh, from um, actually babies are affected by um, fossil fuel uh, exposure even before they're born proximity residential proximity to fossil fuel operations uh, it can cause low birth weight premature birth weight um, and uh, air pollution causes inflammation irritation of the airways COPD asthma decreased lung function Leading cancer killer, lung cancer, uh, is uh, caused by air pollution. Um, particulate matter crosses uh, into the bloodstream and causes inflammation of the heart system. Heart attacks, irregular heartbeats, strokes, and premature death are uh, also associated with um, uh, air pollution. Could you, next slide. Thank you. Um, one of the things that is uh, less talked about is how actually air pollution affects our brain. Uh, so particulate matter can actually cross into our brain directly through the olfactory nerve um, and um, can directly affect our brain function. Uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are uh, extensively used in um, uh, fossil fuel operations uh, are part of these particulate matters and volatile organic compounds uh, that can cause neurodegenerative disease. Um, this pollution can lead to poor neurological development in children, slower cognitive processing, behavioral problems, autism spectrum, and also dementia. Uh, air pollution has been correlated with amyloid deposition. Next slide. Um, so Dr. Carter spoke about ozone exposure. So you are exposed to ozone when you take a deep breath and you feel like your lung is on fire. You're, you're just burning from inside out. So ground level ozone or smog is created with volatile organic compounds and nitrogen oxides interact chemically when they're exposed to heat. This heat can come uh, from warming climate, but also from combustion, any form of combustion including hydrogen, uh, can lead to creation of NOx. Um, the other uh, element, volatile organic compounds, also are emitted from refineries, from other aspects of fossil fuel um, um, operations, and can include, actually, benzene, formaldehyde, tulane, and uh, other ke toxic chemicals that can lead to cancer. There are many other toxic chemicals. Many of them are actually not disclosed. And um, sometimes we're dealing with mystery chemicals when we're dealing with uh, fossil fuel operations. Uh, fossil fuels also lead to uh, pollution, not just through air, also by 
uh, caused by polluting earth and by polluting water systems. Next, please. And um, these exposures are not shared um, equally. So the built environment uh, and climate change are, um, are not distributed equally. So the built environment is different for different people. And these are sometimes manufactured, for example, uh, if uh, some of you may know about redlining policies in the 1930s uh, enacted in the US, in United States, uh, which was called also Homeowners Loan Act or residential safety maps. Uh, these policies prevented black, indigenous, brown and Asian communities in the United States um, to actually build intergenerational wealth, get loans to buy a home or start a business. When you look at those maps and you look at oil well densities in United States today, you can actually overlap them and you can see that there are higher number of uh, oil wells in the neighborhoods that previously redlined. Um, the same applies to air pollution. So when you look at today's air pollution, uh, the air pollution, if you put the map of the redlining and you put the map of nitrogen dioxide pollution, um, you can see that actually there is an overlap uh, with, uh, so the, pre, the past policies affect the present day uh, built environment. Same with heat, heat islands. So when you look at um, green spaces, the green spaces are uh, primarily located outside of what was considered in the 1930s uh, high risk neighborhoods where black, indigenous, brown, and Asian communities um, were living. Uh, next slide. Um, so why should we care about climate solutions? The third pillar of fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is that we wanna expedite real climate solutions and we want a just transition. The reason is because many real climate solutions have immediate and significant health benefits and can address health inequities. And many false climate solutions actually harm overburdened communities that are already exposed to these excessive um, pollutions. Next slide. Um, so talking about false climate solutions that are actually more harmful than helpful, uh, certainty is in emission reduction. That's why we are calling for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Uh, when we have direct emission reduction, we know that we are reducing not just CO2, but also all these health harming toxic chemicals. Um, so carbon offsets, carbon trading, carbon capture, these are all uh, tricks that um, uh, fossil fuel companies have come up with to actually derail us from a real uh, healthy uh, path in the future. Next slide. Um, so public health risk from these type of policies are, for example, when you look at carbon capture sequestration and utilization, um, let's just take a moment and think about what we're talking about. CO2 is a colorless, odorless, uh, heavier than air asphyxiant. So when we are exposed to 4% uh, concentration of CO2, actually that is not compatible with uh, survival for humans. Uh, it causes metabolic acidosis and leads to sickness. Um, energy sources that are used to capture CO2 actually lead to uh, poor air quality in the local communities. And let's uh, just take a step back. Where are these projects planned to start? They're all in already overburdened communities. Um, they're uh, just going back to the health harms of CO2. Um, there is um, a case of a CO2 pipeline and there are many others, but this one was reported and captured. Um, likely there are many others that are unreported, um, but this one was near a community uh, in uh, US in uh, 2020 and um, every member of the community was sent to the hospital when the emergency vehicles actually arrived at the site. And this is a picture of that pipeline rupture. Um, 
they actually emergency vehicles could not function because the CO2 replaced the oxygen so the combustion engine could not work. There's also uh, a report of national CO2 release in 1980s in Cameroon that killed 1800 people. So this yeah. whole idea that the industry is not promoting that we're gonna just continue business as usual. We're gonna continue with fossil fuel operations. We're to con gonna continue with uh, polluting industries and then we're going to capture CO2 and then transfer it through pipelines um, and then inject it into the ground is truly terrifying um, idea. Um, injections also, the plan for injections are uh, in overburdened communities and um, there is risk of earthquake, there is risk of leak, and uh, we could face a catastrophe like the ones that are described with uh, just natural release of CO2 uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, there is a very nice article in British Medical Journal describing um, all the experiences that people had that were exposed to the uh, natural CO2 release in Cameroon. Um, this uh, picture is uh, from a video. If, if you have a few minutes, uh, you can watch the video. This is a um, kind of, sim this is, they, they caused a rupture to kind of watch to see what happens when there is a CO2 leak. Again, because CO2 is heavier than air, uh, it hugs the ground and travels for many miles and you can't stop the, tra the traveling asphyxiant. Um, it's actually much more dangerous than methane leaks um, until you stop it at the source. Next slide. So just, just this climate chaos, all these false solutions that are not gonna lead us to um, any healthy uh, future are not necessary. If we embrace fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty um, and we actually realize there's enough affordable renewable energy capacity in every part of the world and yep. people can live in healthy communities. So natural carbon sequestration, non-renewable energy is what health professionals endorse and what, um, what we need. Uh, to have a livable future. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And I've been sharing links into the chat. You can follow the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty um, on Twitter. And I also shared the link to the letter from healthcare professionals. Um, that brings us to the end of our speakers. And I am so grateful and so thankful to everyone um, who joined us today to speak. Um, these next couple of slides are just showing who endorsed um, this report that we're releasing today. Um, and you can follow us on uh, the Climate Safe Pensions Network on Twitter and stand.earth as well. I shared those links into the chat, um, but we would really like to thank everyone who endorsed the report, everyone who helped with the report, and everyone who made this event today possible. Hearing about all of these you know, uh, the impacts and, and how this affects our bodies and how this affects our planet makes it that much more important um, that we share this report and that we get this report out there, that we talk to NAM, that we talk to our healthcare institutions because healthcare pensions can and must divest from fossil fuels to protect our health and to protect our frontline communities that are so disproportionately affected by the fossil fuel industry. The urgency of this climate crisis and the implications for global public health and equity and the health sector's singularly unique responsibilities toward public health demands a response from the health sector that directly addresses the root cause. Um, and I will turn it over to Don um, to say goodbye to everyone, um, but we would like to thank you for being with, here with us today. Um, please download the report here. I will share it into the chat. Please read it. Please email us. Um, with any questions, thoughts, or comments. Um, and for press, you can contact our media director, Lindsay. I'm sure you have her information um, if you'd like to speak with one of the campaigners or one of our speakers today. Um, and I'll turn it over to Don to say goodbye. Thanks, Amy. Real quick, thanks to everybody. The speakers, you, you're you very powerful and you're, you're, speaking, um, you're speaking truth to power. Um, again, the time has come. Uh, we can remember when... Um, hospital systems started to divest from tobacco 
and I'll just leave this thought that we look forward, our campaign looks forward to the day when we loudly congratulate and applaud the first major healthcare system which announces a fossil fuel divestment commitment and sets the precedent. Um, and thank you all for helping us together to make that happen. Yes. Thank we'll you be in that. touch. Yep. Reach, out, <laughs> reach out on any of these interacting uh, perspectives, um, but thanks for participating in this. Thanks everyone, have a great day.